Cyrus is the Center for Advanced Study in Religion and Science, and we're always excited to welcome a new speaker to our community. Um, today's, uh, today, I'm going to introduce Grace Wolf Chase, who is the Vice President of Cyrus, and she will introduce our speaker. Grace. Thank you so much, Gail. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Brother Guy Consomagno, the Director of the Vatican Observatory. I first met some of the Jesuit astronomers 40 years ago when I started graduate school in astronomy at the University of Arizona, the part-time home of the Vatican Observatory. I met Brother Guy shortly after I moved to Chicagoland in 1998. And I don't know if Guy remembers this or not, but I think our first discussion was about a letter to the editor of Nature that presented results of a study of religious beliefs of scientists in the National Academy of Sciences. Guy has been a frequent visitor to Chicago, and he presented some of the best attended and highly praised lectures at the Adler Planetarium. I remember cautioning the folks at the Planetarium store that 30 copies of Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial and other questions from the astronomer's inbox at the Vatican Observatory would not be enough for a book signing event several years ago. And I got to say, I told you so, when demand exceeded supply. Brother Guy received undergraduate and master's degrees from MIT and a PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona. Before entering the Jesuits in 1989, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard and MIT, served in the US Peace Corps and taught university physics at Lafayette College. He's worked as a Vatican Observatory astronomer since 1993. His research explores connections between meteorites, asteroids, and the evolution of small solar system bodies. He's published more than 200 scientific papers and he's authored or co-authored four books exploring faith and science issues, including the aforementioned Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial with Paul Mueller, as well as God's Mechanics, Brother Astronomer, and The Way to the Dwelling of the Light. I have and highly recommend all of them. He's also hosted science programs for the BBC, appeared in numerous documentary films and served as chair of the American Astronomical Society's Division for Planetary Sciences. Like our June speaker, David Grinspoon, Brother Guy has an asteroid named for him and he's a recipient of the Carl Sagan Medal for Public Communication of Planetary Science by the American Astronomical Society. Over the years, Guy, you've helped me to expand my thinking in so many ways and I know you've done this for many other people as well. And we'll no doubt do so again tonight in Your God is Too Small. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. Uh, I have to finish your story by saying that uh, your conclusion about that survey was people who belong to the National Academy are generally people who don't have a life, <laughs> which has a certain truth to it. What I want to talk about today, though, is something is a question that's been around for a long time is the question of how do we deal you know, with God in a universe that seems so enormous? And you might think that this is something that comes out of modern science and modern astronomy, but in fact, it's been around since the psalmist. Uh, Psalm 8 begins, Lord, our so sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you've established, what are human beings that you're mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? And yet you've made them a little lower than God, crowned them with glory and honor. It's a fascinating question. How do we deal with a universe that is so enormously big? The fact of the matter is most of the time we deal with it by not thinking about it. Uh, Chesterton was talking about this when he wrote in Orthodoxy, the earth is so very small and the cosmos, uh, very large, and the cosmos so very small, about the smallest hole that a man can hide his head in. The cosmos that we live in, we tend to make very, very tiny. So what I want to do is to start by getting you to expand your idea of the cosmos. And I'm going to do this beginning with a short film clip of a friend of mine who works at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And this was from about 20 years ago. The picture will come up soon. Our 
our last storyteller uh, is Steve Collins, and Steve is the attitude control um, uh, manager on MER. Actually, until this morning, I didn't have any idea what uh, Steve was going to talk about, and when he told me, uh, the, uh, the difference between abstract and reality for him, um, I, th I think you're going to find his uh, story very, very interesting. Thank you, Farooz. Um, I'm actually just uh, one of the many ACS engineers, uh, kind of our boss is uh, Miguel San Martin. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to tell you a story today about uh, an event that happened a few weeks uh, after the two landings. Um, I'm an attitude control system engineer. I'm responsible for the gyros and the thrusters and the software that keeps the spacecraft or the rover pointed in the right direction. Um, and as such, I live in this world of numbers. And um, sometimes it's hard to go from those numbers to the picture of what the spacecraft is doing. But, uh, but that's kind of the job, is to figure out from the numbers, what direction is the spacecraft pointed today? Um, so uh, a few weeks after the landings, we were kind of in a groove at that point. We were living on Mars time, and so we were coming in at weird hours and not sleeping very well. And so it was the middle of the night, and um, I was in the control room. I was just coming off shift, and somebody, one of the other engineers, uh, came came by the console and kind of just you know tapped me on the shoulder and said, "Go up to the sixth floor and uh, check out the pictures." And then you know he kind of went away, and it was kind of like it was a, a secret, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or something special. And, um, and so I went up, on, once I got off shift, I went up to the sixth floor to the uh, UN Conference Center. Uh, <laughs> that's what uh, I, a lot of you know, the room I'm talking about. It's, it's this large conference room where uh, the science working group uh, makes their, you know, argues about who's going to do what with the rover the next day. Uh, and it has a big U-shaped table and microphones at all of the chairs. And uh, it looks like a, the UN Conference Center. Uh, one of the things that they have in there is this, uh, is this high resolution projection TV that's like, you know, goes onto a screen 15 feet wide. And uh, so I go in there and, and the place is dark. It only gets used a, a few hours a day when the science team is making all these critical decisions about the rover planning. Um, but so I go, go in there and it's dark and it's quiet and there's a picture up on, on this big uh, high resolution screen and you can't really make it out. And you can't really make it out because it's, uh, it's in 3D. And it's in the fancy kind of 3D, not the red-green glasses kind, but the kind that takes a set of special electronic glasses. Um, and, uh, and when you put them on, you can see the, uh, the, the picture in color, in the actual natural color, but it's in 3D. And so I go in there and I step to the center of the room in the middle of this big U-shaped table and I, there's a pair of glasses there on the, uh, on the table and I put them on and I'm standing on the surface of Mars. You can roll the, um, the, the clip that we have of this. And, and what I'm looking at is a color, high resolution panorama of the of the Spirit landing site, and and it's in 3D, and off in one corner I can see Sleepy Hollow, which is a, a sand trap that we decided we wanted to be careful and not drive into, and and the thing slowly pans around, and as it pans around, you can see there where the airbags have have been you know drawn back up and left uh, scrape marks in the soil, and we pan around a little bit farther, and off in the distance. You could, there's a line of mountains you can see, and as it goes farther, you, you can see the whole expanse of the Columbia Hills out in the distance. And, and it's like changed from being a set of numbers, you know, on these telemetry screens to being a place. It, it's, it's a place. And I, you know, I'm thinking, can I, I wonder if we could drive the rover all the way over to the Columbia Hills. I mean, could we possibly do that? Um, I, I sat there uh, in the dark uh, by myself for maybe 20 minutes and just, you know, let this, uh, this panorama scroll by and, um, you know, thought about, holy cow, what, 
look at what we've done. It's a place. That's the view that uh, an astronaut is going to see when they step out onto the surface of Mars for the first time. So I went back downstairs to the MSA and tapped my buddy Tony, who, who had just uh, uh, replaced me on shift. And I, I told him, you know, when you get a chance, you know, when you have a chance for a break, <laughs> go up to the sixth floor and check out the pictures. <laughs> So, we don't have quite that scene, but here's a, a Martian image scrolling by that will help get you into the mood of being someplace that is a place. It's a planet that you can walk around on. The sky is pink because there's air that has fine Martian dust, finer than flour, suspended in the air and dust on the ground, but, you know, rocks over the dust. And it's a place that you could imagine, you know, going skiing, going hiking, doing geology, just sitting back and admiring the view, painting a picture, taking a look at it. And it's a place that is every much as real a place as any place on Earth. It's a place that, you know, we human beings haven't visited, but certainly our machinery has. We've left our mark on that place. We've, you know, even left a little bit of garbage on the place. And there's something remarkable about knowing that we have touched this other planet. The craters that you see as giant, you know, round markings when you're looking at them in a telescope, they're depressions are as real as meteor crater on earth and you can see how they're filled with sand and the sand has been moved around by the winds you can see uh, cliffs that have stratigraphy the way that the grand canyon has stratigraphy you can do geology on this place you can see where the rocks have been layered probably left by layers of water that is no longer there and hills in the background Rocks that have been piled up by impact craters. Combinations of both. And the sand dunes, loaned together but obeying the same laws as sand dunes as the sand dunes you find in the Sahara. It's a place. A remarkable place. We've now sent, oh, almost half a dozen rovers there. And some of the images I have are from the early ones. The, the MER that he's talking about were later called Spirit and Opportunity. And, you know, they've lasted 3,000 days. They're designed to last for 30 days. As we got braver, we began to land them closer to mountains so you could go and explore what's actually going on in the mountains. And the last couple of images here are from the Perseverance rover, the one that landed just last year, actually earlier this year. The whole spirit of this is to get you used to the idea that we are talking about a world that is bigger than just planet Earth a world that we can explore with these rovers and even as you see here, the little drone that can get up and fly around. This is the universe that we are now exploring as just part of our own backyard that we get to on a regular basis. The Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Indians, they've all sent probes to Mars. And you can start seeing evidence of, you see that little black spot in the odd you know, square crater? There's liquid down there. The liquid 
carries dark material and then the liquid evaporates because the air is pretty thin. But it's a place that evolves. And it's a place that, for all we know, could have had life in the past, maybe underneath the rock still does. More streaks of liquid coming out of sub, uh, subterranean levels. Do you really call it geology when it's not geos? Is it areology? It's a remarkable place. And it has the same sunrises and sunsets, though the sun is a little bit smaller. It is still part of the same universe that St. Francis wrote about when he wrote, Laudato si, be praised, be praised, my Lord, through all your creatures, my Lord, brother, son, who brings the day, you give light through him, and he's beautiful and radiant in all his splendor, of you most high, he bears the likeness. Be praised, my Lord, through Sister Moon. And of course, you probably recognize if you got to see the eclipse, that was the 2017 eclipse, and the moon is what's blocking out the sun. Be praised in the stars and the heavens. You've made them bright and precious and beautiful. An image made by the Vatican's telescope here in southern Arizona. And we have these images of stars being formed in these Hubble images. He praised my Lord through brother fire, through whom you brighten the night, beautiful and cheerful and powerful and strong. And this, of course, isn't you know, the kind of fire that you see on Earth. These are the eruptions out of the sun as imaged in, uh, in a telescope in the Canary Islands. Me praised my Lord through brothers wind and air, fair and stormy, all weathers moods which you cherish, all that you have made. This is actually Antarctica. I took this picture 25 years ago when I was still young and foolish and went to Antarctica to look for meteorites. And we had 12 days of snow and wind where we were just stuck in these tents out in the Antarctic plateau. Uh, it was so cold that you could eat four giant Cadbury bars of chocolate and not put on weight. Boy, that was a great place to be. And he praised my Lord through Sister Water, useful and humble and precious and pure. This is the moon Enceladus, which orbits Saturn. And nearly 50 years ago, I was doing models in a computer to guess whether or not there could be liquid water below the icy crust. And now we've actually seen the liquid water coming out of the cracks in that crust. The same water, the same molecules, the same you know, hydrogen and oxygen that uh, Francis was thinking of when he thought of water here on Earth. And then one of my favorite pictures, this is Saturn, seen from the far side of Saturn compared to where we are. You're seeing the dark side, the nighttime. The rings you're seeing are the dust rings that scatter the light forward the way that, you know, dust in a room scatters light that comes through a beam and a crack in the curtains. And inside that little circle is a tiny dot, and that tiny dot is planet Earth. Be praised, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth. What does it mean for us to know that we are creatures living in such a huge creation. And really all we've been looking at here is just our own solar system, which is nothing compared to the billions of stars in our own galaxy or the billions of galaxies that you can find throughout the universe. As I say, these questions are nothing new. They go back to our scripture. And it's fascinating to see how scripture actually talks about this universe, because it's not only the immensity you see in the Psalms, it's not only the immensity in space, but it's also the immensity in time, a universe that goes back to the creation point. Our story of creation is given in Genesis 1, and in the communities of the book, the, the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims, we are given an explicit statement that understanding the universe in space and time 
is a religious act. Now, if you're a scholar of scripture, you probably know that Genesis 1 sounds in many ways an awful lot like the old Babylonian creation myth. And it was probably written during the Babylonian captivity. There's even words that are shared uh, between the, the two. What's important is not the science that's in Genesis 1. It was the best science of its day, Babylonian science. But what's important are all the ways that the book of Genesis is different from the Babylonian creation myth. First of all, rather than having a bunch of gods fighting over each other, killing a dragon, and by accident, the dragon becomes, you know, where the city of Babylon is going to be made, the planet Earth. Instead, Genesis starts in the beginning, God, God's already there. God is already there in the beginning. So God is not a part of nature. God is there before there is nature. God is supernatural. And then creation is shown step by step, as inevitable as day follows night, everything done in the light, because the first thing said is let there be light. And we're not talking about the light of stars. That's, you know, a later day. We're talking about everything being done so that it can be seen. As creation occurs, it is not the mistaken or the arbitrary whims of some nature god. It is a step that was decided and deliberate, and every step along the way, it was good. The creator is not some spiritual entity that says that the physical universe is evil and we should avoid it. You know, chocolate leads you to temptation and, and acne. But rather, a creator who says, what I have been creating is good. The glory of chocolate is a foretaste of the glory of heaven, as long as you don't abuse it. Creation and nature is the deliberate result of the creator, and it is inherently good. More to the point of being inherently good, it means that studying nature is inherently good, because after all, what is the climax? What is the point? What is all of the story of Genesis aiming us towards? The Babylonian myth, it was the city of Babylon. What could be better than that? In the Genesis myth, in the Genesis story, what we are told is that the climax, the final creation, is the seventh day, the day of rest. All the other days are wonderful, and we get to create you know, food and shelter and clothing, and that's great. But the best part is that we get to be creatures who can kick back and take a look at creation and contemplate what is it and who are we and how does it all fit and what does the beauty and order of creation tell us about the creator. The human creature is more than an animal who just lives to eat and reproduce the intellectual and the spiritual aspects of the human being are, are the pinnacle of creation. That's what makes us more than just, you know, intelligent cats. The Genesis story of creation, contemplating the universe, God calls us to be astronomers. And so we look at this enormous universe full of stars. And at night, if we didn't have light pollution, you could see stars as far as you can see. The longer you look, the fainter you look, the bigger your telescope, the more stars you can see. But it doesn't go on forever. What happens is that we discover we are in a finite galaxy of stars. And when you start looking really faint, the fainter things you see are not stars anymore, but very distant galaxies of stars. The universe is more than just our galaxy. And by the 1920s, you know, 100 years ago, we finally understood that those other splotches of light that we now recognize as galaxies are just as big and just as complicated as our own Milky Way galaxy. And the interesting thing is that these galaxies come in clusters. This is the Virgo cluster. And with a small telescope, you can actually make out a lot of these galaxies. And they're in clusters some places, and then other places, not so many galaxies. And there's a lot of empty space. You know, you've got a grouping of 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 galaxies in a lump. 
a lot of space, and then another lump, another cluster. And these clusters can be grouped into superclusters. And what's interesting is that, you know, the Earth has its gravity and it holds itself together, and the solar system is held together by the gravity of the sun, and the galaxies are held together by the gravity of each of the stars orbiting themselves, and the galactic clusters are held together by their mutual galaxy. And the reason they don't all fall together into one place is because they're spinning, and the spin holds out the galaxies from falling into their common center. But then when you look at each of the different superclusters, you do not see a spinning around a common center. So why don't they all fall together? You know, if the universe keeps on going forever, as you know, as your first guess, probably it would. And if the universe has been around forever, which is, of course, your first guess, probably it would. Then why, in an infinite amount of time, haven't we all fallen together into one big lump? So the guy on the right, Albert Einstein, worried about this. And he devised maybe there's something else, you know, a, a magic force that holds it apart. But the guy in the center with a you know, familiar looking collar um, also had a familiar looking degree. He had uh, two degrees from MIT and a doctorate from Louvain. His name was George Lemaitre and he was a mathematician. He was the kind of guy who could read equations the way that you might be able to read poetry. Oh, the guy on the left, by the way, is Millikan, the, the, the fellow who came up with the idea of the individual at, uh, electron. But I'm going to go back to Lemaitre, because looking at the equations of general relativity, he saw that within the equations was the possibility of an expansion of the universe. And if the universe was expanding, then you could run the movie backwards to a time when there was a beginning, what he called the cosmic seed. This expansion would explain why the universes hadn't fallen together. And you should be able to see this. But it implies that the universe had a beginning. And a lot of astronomers didn't like that idea, including Fred Hoyle, who was actually a great friend of Lemaitre's. But uh, Hoyle made fun of this idea by calling it you know, the Big Bang Theory. Well, Hubble actually saw the expansion and saw that the expansion happened in such a way that the farther away the galaxy clusters are, the faster they're expanding, which means they were all in the same place at the same time. And the expansion doesn't just mean that the galaxies are going on into an empty, infinite empty space, but that the space between the clusters themselves is growing. This is one of those Hubble images, deep field, the farther away you look, and those numbers have a, a detail of just how far away they are, the more you can continue to see galaxies. And by measuring how fast they're moving, you can even work out that the time when they were all together at one place was about 13.8 billion years ago. The energy that must have existed at that point 13.8 billion years ago was so enormous that it stopped matter from even being in the state that we understand. It was in a state that we don't completely understand when quantum physics and general relativity you know, talk to each other, which they don't seem to do anymore. But the universe has gotten so big that the energy is all spread out and that energy has dropped down to just a few degrees above absolute zero. But you can measure that. And that was done you know, first by the, in the microwave by the COBE. Uh, this is now nearly 20 years ago. Um, that yin yang that you see on the left, that's just because the spacecraft is orbiting the Earth. And you can see the, the motion of that. You take that out. Then you see the, the, uh, the effect of our own Milky Way galaxy. You take that out. And you see slight variations in the amount of energy, which means that going back to when this radiation was emitted and, and able to be seen, you can see slight irregularities that would eventually turn themselves into galaxies and galaxy clusters and stars. And I want to remind you, the Big Bang is not about stuff spreading out into an empty universe. The universe itself is spreading. The space between the galactic clusters is spreading. And the beginning is when all matter is concentrated into a point. The entire universe is at that point, and nothing, not even nothingness, exists except for it. And this comes out of Einstein's general theory of relativity, 
that says that the universe, in the universe, mass warps space. In the expansion, you can even ask what's going to happen in the future. Will eventually the mutual gravity of all this stuff cause everything to collapse together? The best measurements say that that yellow curve is not what happens. We're apparently pretty close to the, the, the blue curve that the universe is expanding at just such a rate that the expansion is going to continue forever. So what happens when eventually the clusters of galaxies get further and further and further apart? We're now talking hundreds of billions of years from now. Well, within our own galaxy, one thing might happen, which is to say the laws of thermodynamics might kick in. There's an old joke among thermodynamicists that the, the three laws of thermodynamics are like you know the hard earned laws of a casino. You can't win, you can't break even, you can't get out of a game. Okay, you got a hundred people bringing their money to the casino. At the end of the day, that's all the money that's in that casino. The casino isn't you know printing new money in the basement. So the best you can do is rearrange whose pockets the money you're in. You can't win. But as you know, the guys running the casino have to pay for those fancy tables and pay for the electricity. So they're taking a cut out of every winning. So you can't even break even if you're counting up everybody at the casino. More to the point, there isn't any other casino you can get to. You can't get out of the game. Mass and energy are like that. The mass energy of the universe ultimately is a constant. The amount of energy isn't growing or shrinking. And yet the universe is rearranging itself into a state of higher entropy. What do we mean by entropy? If I've got a nicely arranged um, office and I do nothing except sort of, you know, I don't spend any time cleaning it up. As I use the office, things get messier and messier and messier because I go from an ordered state to a disordered state. And one disordered state looks like any other disordered state. It takes energy to reorder the state. What do I mean by taking energy? You think of energy as, you know, the, the gasoline in your car that allows it to, to move and yeah, burn up energy. But, but energy is conserved. So how is it that we've got an energy crisis? How is it that we can You can only do work with energy, fixing up the office by having the energy flow from a hotter state to a cooler state. And that means eventually if the universe is completely spread out and all of the energy is completely spread out, then you have everything down to a few degrees above absolute zero. There is no hotter state left over. There is no cooler state for it to flow to. And that's what's called the heat death of the universe. The bigger the difference between the hotter and the colder, the, mo the more efficient your engine. As that difference disappears, your engine stops working. Meanwhile, the universe is continuing to expand. Starlight itself is expanding into this ever-increasing void. Its energy is getting cooler and cooler, just like that phenomenally hot energy of the Big Bang is turning itself into the very, very faint energy of you know, the three-degree backbound radiation. And even as stars die and you know, make materials that are eventually going to try to make new stars, there comes a point when everything's turned into iron 60, which you, know, you can't get any more energy out of fusion of fission. Once we're in that state, an expanding empty universe with ever expanding radiation, nothing more should happen. Nothing more can happen. No reservoirs of hot energy, no sinks of cold energy. It's called the heat death of the universe. That's the way the universe ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Actually, when you look at the amount of time that the universe has when it's fresh enough to have stars still burning, planets full of life that the stars can shine on, when you think of all of that, you know, here on Earth, we're in a really special time because most of the time of the universe by this model is going to be cold and damp and, and dull and empty. 
Is God the God of this universe as well? Is that what we're all fated towards? Well, maybe. The fact of the matter is that we're pretty sure what happened in the past because you can see things from the past, but we don't have any data from the future. So we're not really sure what the future of the universe is going to look like. And there are many other theories out there, but all of them eventually come to this, well, not really sure where we're going. What does traditional Christianity have to say about the end of the universe? Actually, a lot less than you might think, or maybe more than you might think, depending on what you think. Throughout the ages, people have talked or hoped for some kind of eternal afterlife. You know, practical people are going to say, well, I can get immortality for my achievements. Maybe my offspring will, will keep my name alive. But even that's limited. Here's Julius Caesar. Everybody remembers him, but his tomb is already crumbling. And, you know, we still remember Caesar 2,000 years later. But sooner or later, every monument to him, every book with his name in it, it's just going to be left on the surface of a cold, starless planet, scrambled beyond recognition by entropy. If the universe is fated to a heat death, then there's not going to be any kind of living entity possible. Not in nature. Maybe in that supernatural? That split between the natural and the supernatural is so obvious to modern Christians that you know, there aren't many believers who are actually bothered by this. They say, oh, this kind of split between the natural and the supernatural, well, natural universe will go away, but I'll live in the supernatural universe, and that's just fine. Trouble is, that kind of split between natural and supernatural is actually not traditional Christianity. It's more like a 17th century understanding where you've got you know, the mechanical Newton universe split from the religious universe of God. But that's not found in scripture. That's not found in our traditional understanding. Of, I mean, God so loved the world that he sent his son. That's the Christian belief. Christianity is an incarnational religion. If God so loved the world, then the world matters. So what happens to it matters? So. Is it just doomed to be, you know, totally dead? If our experience after death is just going to be wholly supernatural, then why is it Jesus never talks about that? Look carefully. He never talks about life after death. He talks about eternal life. He talks about conquering death. The image, the stories we have in him in scripture about his resurrection says that when he's in his risen form, he, he has a body so physical that you can still see the scars of the crucifixion. So physical that he can still enjoy eating a fish dinner. And yet, if this physical universe has an eternal meaning, how do you reconcile that with this scientific idea that, you know, the universe is ultimately going to be gloomy and boring? The creed that we say says that, you know, Jesus is going to come to judge the living and the dead. His reign will have no end. Well, you know, if he's reigning eternally, one would hope that there's more than just cold dust in the universe for him to be reigning over. And that means that not only Christ, but we are expected in some way to be around and alive eternally. You know, now that you and I have come into an existence, there's no getting out of it. We're stuck with each other forever in one form or another. You know, the actual resurrection isn't described in the New Testament. The Gospels only report the discovery of the empty tomb and some appearances of the risen Christ to his friends. What does this resurrection actually mean? It's clearly meant to indicate when we see the way that the resurrection is described, that the resurrection is not merely something sp spiritual. It actually involves a body. There's a fundamental identity between the crucified Christ and the risen Christ. And this recognition happens through the senses, seeing the risen one, hearing him speaking, touching him. At the same time, it's not just some kind of zombie-like reanimation of the dead body, because the risen Christ does things that ordinary bodies don't do. Um, his closest friends don't immediately recognize him. He appears inside of locked rooms. He comes and goes in ways that an ordinary body doesn't. Likewise, 
the death of a human individual doesn't mean that the person is completely dissolved until the resurrection happens. This is not, you know, like, like some Eastern religions where the individual is lost into a mass of consciousness. No, the church insists on identity and continuity between the deceased person and the resurrected one. Now, the way that traditionally uh, the philosophers have dealt with this is to use Greek philosophy that, that you know, divides the universe into a soul and a body. You know, the, the, that, that way you've got something around waiting for the body to come back. But what do we mean by soul? Well, the, the, the philosophers of the Middle Ages had this language of form versus matter. And so to a given world, the matter is something that the soul gives form to. Whatever we meet is animated by the soul. But this division of the human body into body, the human being into body and soul is a philosophical convention. It's useful to explain the theological truth that somehow we survive in the body as in around. But it doesn't presuppose that the same truth couldn't be expressed in other ways, in other philosophies. And let's face it, most of us don't think in Aristotelian philosophy anymore. So let's try a more modern analogy. Think of the soul as analogous to the data in a computer. Like, like all analogies, it's going to fail miserably when you push it too far, but, but, but stay with me. It can at least help illustrate some of the issues involved in defining just what it is that survives after death. So, you know, so you and I own identical computers. How do I know that mine is different from yours beyond the fingerprints on mine and the scratches on yours? Because it's got a completely different set of files than yours. Maybe it's even running a completely different operating system. Now, it's not only a matter of physical differences. The computers can be identical models, have the same size, the same shape, the same weight, maybe different colors. That's about it. The only real difference is that, you know, um, the state of the electrons, if we had a hard disk, then there are metal grains in the hard disk that have, you know, grains representing ones and zeros arrayed differently. The real difference, though, is in the ideas present. Because even those grains don't mean anything without an operating system to put those you know, images onto a screen and a human being who looks at that screen and recognizes the light and dark bits as being letters. The difference isn't just in that most subtle difference of the grains that represent the ones and zeros, because the ones and zeros are meaningless unless there is a human being looking at the computer. Think about how this has played out in you know, copyright law in the last 20 years. Back in the days when you buy a movie on a DVD, nobody denied that you owned the piece of aluminum or mylar or whatever it was that the information was written on. But did you own the ideas in the medium? You know, when you buy a book, you own the paper that the letters are printed on, but do you own the words? When you download a movie and you've paid for the download of the movie, what actually have you paid for? What have you purchased? My point is to draw a distinction between the wetware of the human animal, our bodies, and the ideas and the memories and the emotions, and most essentially, the self-awareness, the intellect, and the free will that comes with being a human being. And Thomas Aquinas definite, defines the soul as intellect and free will. And it's a really useful definition. But in another sense, it's also artificial. You know, the soul, like the program of the computer, has no physical existence without something to have it, you know, like, like the software doesn't exist. But does software exist, even if it's never been written down? Does the idea behind a computer program have an existence even after all the computers that can run it are long gone? Couldn't you invent a science fiction scenario where a person's awareness and free will survive the destruction of the body, you know? Maybe they're stored in some computer someplace, but, but if you're God, who needs that even? Now, I'm doing this as an analogy to show you 
that physical isn't necessarily the entire story, that the universe is bigger than physical. I'm not saying that our souls is the same thing as computer programs. I'm saying that thinking of it of this, this way gives you a hook to understand the issues that go into what it means to exist in a universe where the physical parts are continually changing. Go back to that computer analogy. Is a computer program that's been copied to another disk the same? What do we mean by same? The same program. If you're transported by a Star Trek transporter beam, disassembled at one end, and then reassembled someplace else by atoms there, not the atoms that your body were made out of, are you really the same person at the other end of the transporter? What happens if more than one copy gets made? You know, we've, we've seen that episode. Is the body at the end of time the same as the body that the person had when they died? You know, my dad lived to be 100. I doubt there's an atom in that body that was there when he was born. And yet we continue to identify him as the same person. On the other hand, there are software companies that say, hey, if you've you know, replaced too many uh, parts of your computer, you can't run our software anymore without buying a new copy. Maybe this allows you to appreciate the importance of the physical body, not just the soul, in defining the individual. Uh, and, and, and this is a variant of what's called in philosophy the Thevius' ship problem. You take a ship, you disassemble it, you use half of the parts to build one ship and the other half of the parts to build another ship uh, with, with new parts uh, you know, filleting in, which was the original ship. And the time to be passed from the end of a person's life until that resurrection of the body at the end of time, can the human soul be thought of as existing? Does it exist like the idea of a poem that's never been written down? Can it exist without any kind of materialization? On the other hand, if there is no physical material, what does time actually mean itself? The point of this is to, first of all, remind you that deriving a physical scientific implication for the end of the universe from religious principles is a hopeless task. And therefore, trying to derive religious principles from the best we know of the science at the moment, which may look ridiculous in 100 years time in any event, is probably also hopeless. The one thing that I hope does come true, through to this is that reality is more than the physical part of the universe, but reality wouldn't exist without the physical part of the universe. And this universe extends from here to the edge of the visible universe and who knows how far beyond, and it extends from the beginning of the universe and Possibly you could dream up universes that had an existence of some sort before that beginning to whatever end may exist. You know, when, when the writer of Genesis was describing the universe as a flat plane with a dome above and water above and below, and they said bigger than that is the God who made it. That was as big a God as they could imagine. But what about a universe this big? Take Does it all of this just make us feel smaller and more insignificant and destroy the thought that God just made me and just made you? Well, I think it can only do so if we have the wrong idea of God. The problem is we never make God big enough. And that's true of you know, us, it's true of people who, think, who professionally think about God. Some theologians don't make God big enough. God is big enough to make everything important. We're not, we have to, I pay attention to you now, I can't pay attention to other people. We're limited, God's not. God can make everything in the universe important and that's what God does because God made it and God found everything good. So that's where we are. Thank you very much for uh, attending. And I guess we'll throw it open to questions and comments. 
Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Brother Guy. This was really great. Um, I think the group really enjoyed it. I want to invite people to put their questions and answers in the Q&A box, and we will um, uh, do our best to begin uh, to, to go through them and ask him the questions. And I'm going to just start off first because nobody's entered any questions yet. Brother Guy, could you talk a little bit about the multiverse? That's come up in a lot of uh, different circumstances, and I don't quite see how it fits into the in, in the big picture. Well, you know, the God who is bigger than the universe that we created is a really big God. There's nothing to say that God could not have made more than one universe. The, the people who come up with the multiverse are worried about something called the anthropic principle. And people have tried to use the fact that the universe is just so beautifully fine-tuned with the laws of physics that people like you and me can exist. And they say, is this just mere coincidence? Well, in one sense, if the universe wasn't put together that way, we wouldn't be here to know about it. So what if we had an infinite number of universes and we just happen to be in the one that allows us to exist? That relieves us of having to use the anthropic principle as saying that there was a creator to the universe. And they may be right. I don't like using science to try to prove that God exists. Because, because that makes God uh, you know, subservient to science. But if there is an infinite number of universes, it, you know, possibly with an infinite number of possible ways that people could be in a relationship with a creator, you still have the fundamental creation. Why is there anything? You know, question, why is there anything instead of nothing? And having an infinite number of universes just makes the problem worse rather than better from that point of view. So as, a, as an answer to squeeze out of the anthropic principle, it does it in the short term, but it misses in the long term. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I'm still not seeing any questions in the Q&A box. Let me just tell people, oh, there is one, but let me just tell people how to do it. Um, there's this thing that says Q&A, uh, hit that button and, uh, and, and just enter your question. So uh, there's a question from Kevin Kogan. If entropy is the norm, how do we reconcile complexity and specifically life? Life is a local reversal of ent entropy. Uh, that's the, you know, from a chemical point of view, that's how you can describe it. That when a plant absorbs sunlight, it uses the energy of that sunlight to reassemble the atoms of carbon and oxygen into these complicated molecules that allow itself to absorb more sunlight. And it keeps working so long as there's sunlight available for the plant to assemble and make these complex things out of simple things. Uh, the, the second law of, of uh, you know, thermodynamics is a general rule in the large, but you know you can redo, you can reverse it. Um, one of the examples often given for um, understanding how the second law works is if you had a box of red atoms and a box of green atoms, and you put the boxes together and remove the, the separation until they finally mix up, and then you, you know, one side or the other side of green atoms and red atoms. It's never going to happen if you have enough atoms that all of the red atoms would simultaneously be on one side and all the green atoms on the other side. But I could spend some energy sorting them out and keeping them in a bottle. I can do that, but it requires me to use more energy than the energy that I would uh, get <clears throat> from having them separated. And so in the long run, the whole entropy of the universe gets bigger even as I reverse the entropy locally in that little box. Great, there's a related question. Um, are you suggesting that life will at some point evolve on other planets, not necessarily as life as we know it on Earth? Um, I'm not gonna tell God what he can or cannot do. <laughs> we haven't seen that life yet, but we don't know. That's why we explore to find out. It'd be fascinating to see it. But it'll also be fascinating if we keep looking and never see it. That also would make you sort of scratch your head. Let's find out. Um, next question. How do you envision God? An idea, a thought, a being, Sophia? Oh, my favorite answer I stole from uh, C.S. Lewis. I envision God as an elderly white man with a very long gray beard, not just because I have one. I thought of this, you know. And the reason I envision God that way is it's so ridiculous, I'll know to never believe it. The, the trick in trying to come up with a more 
um, esoteric vision of God is that you might think that that's actually what God is. What is sometimes useful is to, to go back to scripture and see how God describes, God is, God is existence. God is love. Um, I've heard theologians trying to explain the Trinity by saying, well, the love of the Father. And the, no, no. The Father and the Son are created by the love that God is. And is it possible for love to exist without objects of love? Well, maybe that's why there's a Trinity. But God is joy. God is beauty. God is these things that we cannot measure, but we cannot deny they exist. And, and yet each of those is merely the, the, the clue to us that God is there without actually knowing what God is. I haven't seen God face to face, not yet. Okay. Um, God sent his son to earth and the son gave his life once not sent to many earths and not more than one son. Thoughts? I don't know about the second one. I haven't been to many earths. I haven't found out if they've got many. Uh, it's a, you know, we, we say that the second person was the word. Words can be expressed in many languages. And yet, um, one of the fascinating things about the incarnation that we do know is what's sometimes called the scandal of particularity that uh, it was at a particular place, a particular human being in a particular time. God doesn't love humanity, God loves me and you and the 110 other people who are on this individually. God doesn't make a universe of fields, God makes a universe of particles. So how does that play out? I don't know. Uh, Alf Maynard wrote a wonderful poem in 1918, uh, talking about how wonderful it will be when at the end of time, we get to hear how God appeared to these other creatures and these other people. And yet, what examples do we have in our own tradition of individuals, creatures, whatever you want to call it, creations in a relationship with God? The, the, the one that comes to mind are angels. And angels have a salvation story that doesn't involve God incarnating as an angel. So, you know, God's very clever. God can have relationships and, and deal with other entities in ways that I'm not going to limit him to. Okay, great. Um, the next question. This is a little bit more, it's a little longer. Um, so bear with me. Given the self-conscious outcreak, given that self-conscious creatures are the purpose of the universe, then one has to admit that our universe is an extremely inefficient process. I think an insight in this mystery is in the way our universe was created. And I think that this has to do with the fall of the angels. I would like to pursue this with you. Ooh. Well, it's I blind leading the blind, but uh, who says efficiency is you know, a good thing? God is not efficient. God is extravagant. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, the guy I wrote, turn, uh, uh, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial with, uh, Paul Muller, puts it in a marvelous way. God is not fair. God is more than fair. God gives us love beyond what we deserve, what would be fair for us. God gives the universe self-awareness in you and me and whatever creatures are out there in whatever way they're out there above and beyond whatever we think we deserve and when all time is the same time who are we to say what's sufficient what isn't if it took the entire universe to make um you know michelangelo's pieta if it took the entire universe to make beethoven's ninth symphony if it took the entire universe to make a really good bar of chocolate, mm -hmm. uh, who am I to say it wasn't worth it? And I would agree with you on that, especially with the bar of chocolate. <laughs> um, uh, there is a, a question in the chat. I don't normally like to take those, but I don't want to see something go unanswered. 
Isn't the question of multiverses and the anthropic principle a perfectly appropriate scientific subject, but absolutely irrelevant in the language of faith? Your earlier answer seems to suggest that. Um, yes. There is the question of whether or not the multiverse hypothesis is a useful solution to scientific issues. And you need a cosmologist better than me to be able to do that. Uh, you know, my field is meteoritics. That's, it's a legitimate hypothesis, but you know, there are a lot of hypotheses out there that turn out they don't work. You know, we don't have fire because of something called phlogiston. We don't have uh, elect, you know, electromagnetic waves transmitting themselves from star to star because of something called the ether. It's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. Turns out when you try to look for it, it's not there. The multiverse may be one of those kinds of hypotheses. And if you can determine one way or the other that it's likely to be there, more power to you. If you're inventing it just because you're uncomfortable with the idea of a god, which that seems to be a lousy idea to come up with a hypothesis, a lousy reason to. Great, thanks, Brother Guy. Um, I guess I'm getting some questions in the chat because uh, some people can't ask them in the Q&A. Uh, Grace has a question. Um, Grace, why don't you unmute yourself and ask it? Sure. Uh, can you all hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Guy, you and I deal with beautiful things in space and astronomy and physical science. We, I think that it's easier in some respects for physical scientists to think of God in terms of beauty, of love, of just the awesomeness of creation. How do you speak with biologists who bring up the messier side of life? the parasites, the ugly ways some creatures interact with each other. Um, do you have any advice that you would give to a biologist who is struggling to make sense of meaning and purpose when there's so much ugliness? Part of it is that, you know, there's there's ugliness in, in the physical universe, too. If you have a supernova that destroys the solar system, you know, the famous Arthur C. Clarke uh, story of the star. I'll tell you some answers that don't work. I think an answer that doesn't work is to say, well, that's just our suffering here, but in heaven that we won't have to worry about that. That's a cheap answer because it means that the physical universe doesn't matter and that we're just here for a test of some sort of, you know, crazed God who likes to see us you know, squirm for a while. That's not the God I believe in. That's not the universe I believe in. Nor can you say that God doesn't notice or care because he's so far or so distant, because the God we believe in is not only one who came to earth and suffered hunger and sickness and sore feet and friends who betrayed him and a really miserable death. So it's not as if God's not aware of that. It's also not sufficient to merely say it has something to do with free will. You know, if we weren't so busy trying to uh, you know, beat up on each other, we'd have the resources so that we would be able to cure diseases. Mm, no, I don't think that's that simple. What I do know is that the God we want to believe in is the God who says that he has conquered death, and not in the future tense that he will conquer death, but that he has conquered death. I don't know quite what that means, but I do know that if there is any answer at all to be found, it has to be found there. And in the meanwhile, you know, as destructive as a supernova is, the physics behind it is also glorious. As destructive as a parasite is, the, the functionality that goes into the chemistry and the physics of how they work is fascinating enough that, you know, it can involve a person's entire life getting to know it. Um, I'll fall back finally on my Peace Corps experience because you know you'd mentioned in your introduction I spent two years in Africa, and you know third world living. I was there thirty years ago, but it you know hasn't changed that much. It's hard. You're close to death. You're close to suffering. 
You see it all the time. And yet it does not lead to despair. If anything, you also see God much more clearly there. The temptation in our Western world is to coat ourselves with cotton, to say, if something goes wrong, whose fault is it? And I want to sue them. And somehow that doesn't make us happy. So maybe there's a clue there. Thank you. Beautiful response. I'll send it back to Gail. There are more questions here. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna field one from um, our own Carl Peters, the past president of Cosiris. He uh, he I, he makes a statement which I think he just is looking for a comment or response to. When we think of God, it's so easy to do so in spatial in special terms. God is a being. When you spoke of God as love, it seems to fit with the notion that God is an activity. Some say God is a verb. And all of the images that we come up with God are poetry, because we're using human words that we're familiar with to try to describe something we're not familiar with. And that's what we do as people to try to understand. That's how we do science. Um, you know, we use familiar words in physics like momentum and energy. And yet what we mean momentum is in physics is very different from what you mean in momentum if you're talking political, you know, um, political races or whatever. We can only speak in poetry. Newton's law of gravity is a poem. It is the simile that says the path of a falling object is like the solution to this equation. Like all poetry, you have to allow yourself to close your eyes to the places where it doesn't work in order to glean the little bit of insight that comes with living with it that way. But going back to love, going back to, you know, my parents who lived to be 100, until the day they died, they were still learning new things about each other. They were not creatures who were treating each other like a problem to be solved. And the question of what is God is not a question that you come up with an answer that you can then stick in the back of the book. Um, I had a friend or a philosophy professor who pointed out to me, there was two kinds of questions, you know, do I have enough money in my pocket to buy a candy bar? And if the answer is yes or no, it's a boring question after that. But if the question is, what kind of chocolate do I want? That's a question that's always fresh and new. Um, we, to go to scripture, when Mary, in some ways, the first scientist or the first theologian, you know, brings the 12 year old Jesus back from the, the being lost in the temple, what does she do? What does St. Luke tell us she does? She doesn't sit down and write a three volume treatise on Christology. What she does is ponder these things in her heart. And the poetry gives us a place to begin pondering. But the poetry is not the answer, it's the launching point. Thank you. Um, next questions from uh, Ken Carpenter. The deep field observations suggest that there are more stars and likely planets in evidence than all the grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. How can one convey or even remotely understand the magnitude of a God that might be playing on all these tremendous variety of stages all at once? Yeah, how can you? It's astonishing. Um, incidentally, you know, the farther away you look, the more planets you see, the greater the possibility that there might be something intelligent. But the farther away you look, the lower the odds that we'll ever be able to talk to them just because of the limits of relativity that, you know, every message takes a million years to get from their, us to them and a million years to come back and I'm gonna be busy doing something else by then. It's a fascinating universe that's set up in this way. Uh, and as I say, that statement is absolutely true and coupled with the insight that Father Corbelli, who was the one talking to me in that film clip has at the end, a God who not only is bigger than all of that in space and in time has the capability to be fully attentive to me and to you. 
and maybe to grace. I'm not so sure about that. That is an infinite uh -huh. God. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, next, as God is eternal and God's time is not linear, might it not be possible that our death brings us immediately into the end time? Or alternately, here's another image. Um, I see a, a shelf full of books behind you. I've got a shelf full of books, you know, off to my left. The great thing about a book is that when you read it, it's linear. But when you're outside the book, you can go turn to any particular page and re-experience that particular page because you're outside the universe. Here's an analogy. Maybe the physical reality of our life, it has existed and nothing we've done has, you know, will we'll undo what has happened in the past. Maybe we're writing the novel of our life. Maybe. I'm not saying that that's the answer to this. I'm saying this is a way of remembering that God is not trapped in the same dimensions of space and time as, as we are, just as the questioner put it. And that means that physical reality continues to exist, even when we're no longer trapped in a linear time or a linear place. Great. Um, th this is a, uh, Don Ryder is asking for you to comment. For some, this is all God is, quote, to love another person is to see the face of God, quoting from Jean Valjean in Les Miserables. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely, but, but I'm more than my face. <laughs> I have a history that isn't really shown up in this face. I have a whole extension of other loves that people knowing me don't necessarily know. To see the face of God is certainly to see God, but not to see all of God. To see the love of another person, to love another person, is this tangible reality, this supernatural in our lives to understand um, a scientific conundrum, to see the solution to a mathematical puzzle, to find just the right word that makes the poem work. I think all of those are also to see the face of God. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Maynard Moore. Maynard is uh, the person who runs the IRAS uh, seminars, our, our sister organization. Um, the power of your presentation shows that everything in the universe is related to everything else. Isn't this the foundation for our claim that God is love, where everything is important to God and thus should be precious to us as well? I can see that. I can see that. The, uh, that sense of preciousness comes up, um, there's a marvelous, uh, another quote from uh, G.K. Chesterton that I was thinking to use, it didn't quite fit into the talk, but I think it's appropriate here, where he looks at the relationship between human beings and creation, the rest of creation, as you will. <clears throat> and it comes up in, in Laudato Si, in, in the work that we do to try to preserve the environment. Uh, okay, everybody knows it's a stupid thing to exploit the environment without taking care of it, if nothing else. It means pretty soon you don't have anything left to exploit. But there's something fundamentally wrong with doing that anyway. But the opposite point of view, to uh, think that the universe, the rest of the universe is pure and we're the things messing things up. And the only way to live is to shrink into as tiny a bubble as we can, also misses this relational sense. Um, and Chesterton writes in, in one of his asides in, in Orthodoxy, he says that, you know, to the ancient pagans and to people like Wordsworth, God is a mother and a rather strict mother, and you it doesn't fool to mess with Mother Nature. But to St. Francis, the universe is our sister. We are both children of the same God. You don't exploit the universe any more than you would exploit your sister. You don't walk in fear of the universe any more than you would walk in fear of your sister. 
And he goes on further and he says, it's not just even a sister, but a little dancing, silly little sister that you laugh at as well as love. Now, I'm blessed to have two siblings, a brother and a sister, who I'm really close to. And over the history of our lives, we've also managed to tick each other off. We've had arguments. We've hurt each other. We've also had enough love underneath it that we've gone through those problems. And that is what love is all about. It's, uh, you know, and I, I feel foolish talking about love as a celibate, but as a guy who, you know, failed at making you know, romances work when I was a young man, I could see one of the ways I would fail would be to try to make things perfect, to try to never you know, say my point of view, to try to, oh, I don't want to make her think that she doesn't like me. That doesn't work. That doesn't make for a successful relationship. You've got to be able to argue with God. That's in the Hebrew scripture everywhere, because that's also part of love. And that ability to interact with creation to say this is who i am and what i think i need and you can tell me what you think we need and when we don't agree let's let's argue it out let's come to a compromise let's realize maybe we're arguing about different things but do it because at base we know we love each other that's how we deal with the fact that we are creatures and the rest of the universe is a creature Great, thank you. Uh, next is from Larry Engelhart. If it took the death and resurrection of Jesus to announce death has been conquered, does that mean before Jesus' resurrection, death was not conquered? Well, that assumes a linear God. And uh, as one of the other commenters here has pointed out, God is not confined to time. It's you know the old question, does God know the future? No, God remembers the future. I'm going to give, this is the last question. Um, if we understand the Sabbath as the crown of creation, a time to kick back and take a look at, at, at creation, does that imply a critique of the tight relationship between science on the one hand and technology and consumption on the other? Should we practice a more contemplative science that regularly critiques the pace of technological change, especially given the eco crises? Yes, but I will simply remind you, if you've ever used a really sweet piece of technology, that there is joy and beauty in God to be found in that. <laughs> I'll remind you that if you've ever been, you know, kept alive by a vaccine or an operation or had a loved one kept alive that way, that there is good there, too. I go back to that relationship with your siblings. We are human beings. We are going to sin. We're going to mess things up. But the alternative is to refuse to live at all. That's messing things up even worse. Rather, we have to be creatures who continually strive to atone for the messes, to try not to mess up, but not to be discouraged when it happens anyway. And the technology that poisons the planet is also the technology that allows us to live in a way that's cleaner. I, I go back to my Peace Corps days. Um, there's an awful lot wrong in modern society, alienation and pollution and whatever. But living close to nature, uh, the way that we did for you know, 100,000 years before we had technology, is a pretty cruel way to live. It's a pretty ugly way to live. And the ability to worry about the ecology comes out of an urban, technologically sophisticated society that is comfortable enough to be able to contemplate, how can we do this better? How can we do this cleaner? When you're wondering about how am I going to feed my child this morning, you don't have that luxury. Great, thank you. Um, brother, let me just, brother Guy, let me just tell you that there's so many positive comments in the Q&A, um, thanking you, accolades for it being a great talk. 
asking about whether the recording is going to be available. And the answer to that is yes. I will be sending out information. I think it'll probably be a couple of days before it will be available for people to be able to uh, rewatch it or give it to their friends to watch. Um, I want to thank you for a really outstanding program today. This was great. And the um, number of questions was uh, challenging and you, you held up to it. You want to say something else? Yeah, one, one last thing. I, I made a mistake in getting out of my uh, talk one slide early. I forgot to put up the slide that showed the web address. If people want to know more about the Vatican Observatory and the work we're doing and even ways that you can participate in it. And it's you real know, why simple. Don't you just put it up now? Why don't you just put it up now so people can go to the website? I think that's a good, okay. a good, uh, good way to end. Okay, so let's see if I can do that. Sure. Um, can I figure out how to play this again? Okay. If, if, if you can't, we can provide it on the... Um, yeah, it, it's easy enough to find. It's simply www.vaticanobservatory.org. Okay, great, oh. great. So that, But that's, I think that's here really it is. Awesome. Here it is. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. And there it is. Thanks a bunch, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to Grace for sort of managing all of this. And, you know, thank you to everybody in the audience for your active participation. Um, this was really great, very inspiring to hear it all. Grace, you have a final word? Um, just thank you, Guy. That was awesome. And um, and I'm going to be in touch very soon. <laughs> <laughs>